Yeah, no, Knicks Pacers game seven. I was in attendance. I told Tibbs, uh, if you need 10, 15 minutes, probably can't give more than that, but I got you. He didn't put me in. But no, it was uh it was devastating. But cool experience. Yeah, yeah. And I went with my mom, so our whole mindset going into it was if we win, great. If we don't, it's a nice cap on a great season. The future is bright. It's always tough to uh, prognose what's going to happen in the future because of injuries. I mean, even this year, dude, everyone's saying the East is so weak, but look at all the injuries. So I'm hoping that, you know, they can bring back some of their key guys, maybe yeah. get a D. Who knows if there's a big fish out there, but I'm excited, man. Jalen Brunson, fucking love that guy. Oh, he's the best. He's a great man. I mean, that must have cost, that must have set you back a few euro, huh? A hot ticket. No, it did. I don't know the exchange rate, but <laughs> uh, it, it was so weird, like being away because of the time difference. Like I couldn't, like, oh yeah, that was a fun trip we went on. Yeah, yeah, we did uh, Venice, uh, Croatia. I couldn't watch any of the games. And the only game I got like was when we lost to f- by 40. I was trying to tell you, dude, I got the charter jet. We'll go to MSG. We'll come right back. And you were like, no, you know. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about you Americans always, you know, you don't care about the environment. You just hop on the jet. It's crazy how different it is with you guys over here. It's it's hilarious. Like, like in Luxembourg, they're so obsessed with taking care of the environment. It's like, yo, you have 1.2 million people, man. <laughs> You guys, you know, turning off your water, turning off the lights. <laughs> yeah. Xi Jinping's like, listen, buddy. But like, yeah, for like two weeks, I was out of the loop on everything. I had like, like you guys over here, like movie releases are different. Um, I had no idea what was going on with basketball. No idea what was going on with American football. Uh, so then I just came back and I just had to do like two weeks of catch up. That's fun, man. Just uh, get off the grid. Enjoy the old world. Well, yeah, I came back, you know, I just, I had my morning espresso, my croissant, and just looked up everything I missed, you know? That sounds like a great, that sounds better than the trip, honestly. The <laughs> trip sounds fun, but the plugging back in, yeah, refreshed. No, but uh, yeah, that. you went to a lot of cool places, man. Uh, we were all looking at your stories, really depressed and jealous. <laughs> it was a good time. I wish the weather was a little better. It was like 20 degrees Celsius the whole time. Oh, I'm sorry. It's like 70 degrees for you guys. But yeah, it was a good experience. Uh you know, I don't think it really changed me as a person. I probably gained a few kilo. That's about it. But still the same old Aaron, you know, it's a lot of like a lot, a lot of like what you Americans say is when people go away, oh, they come back different. Um, but not me. No, you you sound like the same old Aaron. You've always hated the metric system <laughs> or, you know, you love the met- we don't do the metric system, right? Um, I, I honestly don't know. Yeah, what is uh, yeah, I can't even tell you what ours is called. But yeah, although I mean, these days we just seem to measure things in uh 911s. That seems to be the impact of everything. <laughs> like every world event happens, it's like this is like 3 911s. And everyone's like, "What?" Yeah, you guys really do always bring up 911. That's big for us. Yeah. I thought I would get a bigger reaction out of this bit from you. I'm kind of disappointed. <laughs> oh, like I'm uh like annoyed by it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, dude, I fucking, I love Europe, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm very pro. We need to, the best part of Europe is that they don't rush you out of a restaurant, that you could sit at a table all day. That, they don't leave you alone, like, they leave you alone. Um, walking down the street and not seeing fucking chain after chain is so refreshing. Like, it's just all, I guess, independent. Oh, like, oh, I thought, I was, I was wondering what the hell you were talking about. Um, right, there's not a lot of chilies. I mean, there's uh, no, yeah, no, not one Chili's. I didn't come across an Applebee's. Uh, I did eat at McDonald's though. I had to, I had to taste that at Italian McDonald's. Yeah, I could see that. I, I, I understand that. I got McDonald's one night in, uh, I was I hoping in Brussels. Had, I was looking for mixed spaghetti. I guess that's not an Italian thing. That's the <laughs> only reason why I went. I wanted to get that mixed spaghetti. You know, if Teddy was here, he would be fucking furious right now. He, uh, he hasn't reacted once to any of the things I've troll them about I think, and that means he's fucking pissed off <laughs> <laughs> he's an interesting guy <laughs> no, i was just in the group chat i just kept going like i would post a picture i'm like you like uh how was it when you came teddy i really enjoyed it <laughs> oh that's fucked up <laughs> that's like... brutal man <laughs> uh, the fucking pandemic sent his ass to hawaii which dude, is you know a lot yeah. of good things to see but it's so cliche well, the one thing I did see when I got off the plane was this guy with an Italian flag tattoo, American guy, 
and it has like La Familia on it. I'm like, yo, they're going to fucking hate you. <laughs> <laughs> it is so absurd. Like when people are like, and it's not like the thing like, oh, like obviously people when you ask like, oh, where are you from? Like, oh, or what are you? They say they're like origin. But when you go there, you realize like that's just so dumb. Like for someone to be like, oh, I'm Italian. It's like, well, I think they yeah, would like yeah. to differ. I always got so confused during the World Cups when everybody was rooting for the country that their, you know, their grandparents came from. I was like, <laughs> are we all Americans? I was like, who roots for America in these things? Yeah. Just British people, just Protestants. But if you ever do go out there and anyone listening, Croatia is fucking awesome, uh, especially if you're a Game of Thrones fan. That was probably the highlight. Just seeing like where King's Landing was, like it, like how they like used that city and were, was able to build their world around it was it was very cool. I enjoyed that a lot. How's the renovation going after uh, the whole Daenerys burning it all down? Are they like, are things looking up? I saw the bell. Um, it was funny to hear like how like our tour guide was how they regard Game of Thrones. Like they love it, but also like little things like where they uh, would put King's Landing, where they would render it into the city. It kept changing and they can notice it because like that's their home. So it was like in a different spot every season. Right. <laughs> and they would just get so pissed about it. But um the only thing I would complain about is the Iron Throne is very underwhelming. It's like I, I, the HBO gave them in Ireland, I think, a replica when they left filming. And um, like it's on, it's off the, the main city. It's like on an island, but it's like unattended. It's just like in a building somewhere. So like it's unattended. You can just go in and out as you please. But like with that comes like the area isn't well maintained. There's really no maintenance. It's like it's cool that it's free for everyone, but honestly, just charge five or ten dollars to get in and maintain it and like spruce up the room a little like that's your main attraction for like the game of thrones tour and it's just very well uh not very well kept hmm that's interesting it's just like in a room it's like in an old little castle but like there's like dust everywhere it's dirty there's like shit all around it pay people maintain it make it like a, a spectacle but maybe if season eight was a little better they would have maintained it a bit yeah, it's not good for business, man. You could make a little bit of money there. I'll do it. I'd sign <laughs> up for that job. God the throne. And she was going around asking people like, oh, who's everyone's favorite character? And you got the Arias and oh, John and all this. And I got, they got to me and I said Cersei and everyone looked at me like I had 10 heads. They don't have <laughs> I would have said, uh, I would have said Locke. And then <laughs> she would have kept asking trivia questions and like I was getting all of them right. And I just had to stop talking because I didn't want to be the guy in the tour that thinks he knows everything more like I, I know more than you how many questions did you answer before you stopped talking it was like two or three okay i stopped after she asked like oh do you know what the population of king's landing was it was like a like a million she's like oh yeah how'd you know that just got uh, got a podcast on this thing no big deal yeah Check i've always out. wanted to watch that show i've heard it's good i like house of the dragon though it seems a little better more dragons yeah i hear there's a lot of walking a lot of talking and then there's a lot of dick jokes in Game of Thrones. They've got to grow up, right? Eventually. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I'm Bo Oliver, formerly known as Ruben, formerly known as Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron. And we are back for another episode of Nerd Soup. And today's episode, we're going to keep it a little light. We're going to be talking about challengers, kind of catching up on some of these movies over the last few weeks. And then coming up, we're definitely going to do a furiosa review possibly planet of the apes when my mom and my aunt get their shit together and uh yeah we'll be answering some questions follow us across social medias at nerd soup at bow soup at nerd soup monkey uh, at teddy nerd soup give him a follow check in on his workouts because he's always posting his stats making me feel bad about myself and uh aaron as we know you just got back from europe feeling refreshed feeling recharged no i'm feeling pretentious I, I forgot how to sleep like um, that's that sucks <laughs> well no sleeping's not the problem i can't wake up without being in immense pain because i guess i'm sleeping in a week like just started this week but it never happened before and every day i wake up and i can't move my arm for two hours what <laughs> yeah it might be a nerve thing i don't know what's going on i went to get breakfast before and i like i usually go to reach in my left hand if i pay for my card or grab the bag or whatever and i just couldn't grab anything i had to use my right hand Ooh, that seems like, uh, you know, when the, you call the automated response, like, if this is a medical emergency, please hang up. And Are you sure? you? I can do this by myself. But it's like, I guess I'm sleeping on it wrong, but like, I, I don't think I've, unless I just completely sleep different now. Uh, get a little camera. Investigate. Now, what if I see a ghost? 
I gotta move. Oh, what are you talking about? That'd be even cooler. You become friends with the ghosts. You get them to be on your side, haunt your enemies. Oh, that's that's not a bad idea, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, Nash is waking up in the middle of the night. <laughs> I would send a ghost to his ass. <laughs> Who scares Nash? It would be Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> <laughs> I do respect your him. commitment though that, like your family is like you're in Ape's house and you gotta wait for your family to watch it those are yeah those are important movies I mean my dad used to love those movies I sort of inherited them from him the love he liked of those the, movies he liked the Burton one right he did yeah no he did and of course he he liked the originals oh he did he was a uh, well, he was a big Marky Mark guy. My dad was that generation dude they just have it's not that their standards are lower but it's just, they have that appreciation for the magic of cinema. Like, I remember one of our, uh, one of my cousins, he's like, yeah, I can admit that Fantastic Four is awful, like the originals. But as a kid, I always wanted to see that. You know, it was amazing to just see those characters that I grew up loving and reading and, and imagining one day, maybe they could make a movie, see it come to life. Yeah. And I think well, that's kind of how my dad operated and my mom too. My mom is a bit more harsh, actually. Well, with CGI, I think... As much as I think people nitpick it a lot, it really has changed our expectations, uh, especially looking back at the old apes, the magic and the make, the make uh, like the, the effects and what they were able to do with the makeup was probably such a crazy experience for people. And yeah. now we can't go to a movie without nitpicking CGI because we just want everything to look realistic. It's kind of like we want to go back to that. But if we did, if we they did come out with something like that, it would get trash in two seconds. Right. Yeah. No, there's not that appreciation for the practical anymore. And only certain movies like Avatar. And I think with these movies with the motion capture, but I feel like that's kind of even lost now. Oh, yeah. We, even the 2001 uh, apes looks really good. And uh, who's the female ape? Oh, yeah. It's uh, Helena Bonham Carter. I always remember her being a hot ape. <laughs> yeah. Why is this ape hot? <laughs> But yeah, but yeah I'm excited it. to watch that. I've heard it's good. Yeah, it's good. I think it's probably, I don't know if it's better than any of the Reeves, but it's definitely a nice addition. That second Planet of the Apes, the the first one that Reeves did with Koba, incredible <laughs> movie, man. Koba's getting his time right now. Yeah, people love Koba. Oh, the whole that, putting Koba in a movie. Well, that was another one. I just completely missed that. And I came home. I'm like, oh, this is the thing. <laughs> that was one that I didn't love because I kept seeing them. And I'm like, yeah, no, Koba's now in the Muppets. He's not supposed to be there. Yeah. Uh, oh, Koba and Shakespeare in Love. That's how you know. That I is was such away. a great movie. If I was home, I would have photoshopped him in the most ridiculous of movie. Fucking Koba, man. Out of control. Yeah. And Furiosa might be my movie of the year. So a little teaser for our review. <laughs> you go into the jail shower and Koba's sitting there. Yo, when he plays dumb in that, actually, let's not talk about that movie because I could talk about that all the day. But that's a great scene when he plays dumb. Wish I could say Ruben fought the good fight. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let's get into challengers. New Luca Guadagnino, who's become one of my favorites, one of my favorite directors working today. The dude just has he he has what I love when it comes to movies like this: the the ability to create so much tension and atmosphere between his characters. I think that all of his movies have that sort of, um, what's the word for it? They have that edge, that Luca edge that he brings to all of his films. And so I was really happy to see Zendaya get to play a role like this. Everybody's, of course, talking about the love triangle between the the three lead actors, but all of them individually were were really strong. I do have some criticisms with uh, the way that the story kind of shapes out, but overall, I thought it was a very enjoyable, fun, sexy uh, high paced, just electric movie. Yeah, I love this movie. And like you said, he is becoming like one of my favorites as well. When you look at, you know, I think Calling by Your Name, probably both at the top of our list that year. Uh, Suspiria, I know that's one of your favorite movies, probably of the century so far. Oh, yeah, um, no, I love Suspiria. And I think, like you said, he's just able to c- capture these dynamics in such a enthralling way where, um, being able to like take this premise and make it like as high octane as it is and kind of like a thrill ride at times, but it's pretty incredible. That score too is fucking incredible. That's been, yeah, I've been dude. playing that all, all week. Those like synth beats come on and those moments like gearing it up, like it's about to be like a massive like fight sequence and it's just like people staring at each other sexually <laughs> <laughs> and some tennis. I never, I never enjoy tennis this much. Right. Yeah. Tennis is, you know, um, 
I respect tennis, but I've never enjoyed actually watching it. But those, yeah, those matches, and a lot of it has to do with uh, the character development. But yeah, they were really fun to watch. And the the one sequence that has been a bit controversial is when uh, the camera just becomes the tennis ball and it's being shot back and forth. But I like goofy shit like that. And I honestly wish the movie had more of that because it felt like, uh, you know, everything was just so kinetic. And sometimes the visual style wasn't really keeping up with the mm. pace of the relationships between the characters and the dialogue and the comedy. It's small criticism. But when, once I saw that, I knew people were going to fucking hate it and it was going to become a talking point on the internet. But I, I thought it was it. fun. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was a nice little fun part of it. And the way it was sequenced too and edited, like how... Because obviously I didn't really know too much of it going in. I kind of just saw like with the internet, I didn't really watch a trailer. Like when it opens up and they're at that match, first of all, I'm like, oh man, I thought they, I thought these were, these were big boys. Why are they playing in the back, in like some back lot in Queens? So I thought yeah. we we're going to be a, like Wimbledon or something. But obviously as you, the movie progresses, you kind of get the backstory and everything. But when they first met on the, on the, in that tournament in the opening scene, I'm like, oh, like this is the beginning. <laughs> I had no idea that we were going to go back. And I liked how that match kind of, um pl- went along with the story that was being told like in the beginning when uh patrick's winning uh he's winning in their love triangle you know 10 years ago you know and then right, once right. we get to the part of the story where uh you know art is with uh tash uh, tashi then he's winning in that match and he gets his groove back and it kind of reflected what was going on with the backstory yeah, that non-linear structure was was great, and it, it some at times it. I mean, it could have came off gimmicky, but uh, I don't think it ever did because um, you know you're watching these two friends and just the looks on their faces. The you know you don't know much about them, but you can pick up on the fact that there was a love triangle here, and just learning more key information, just peeling back that story. You know, every every new leap was something exciting. Uh, one of my favorite scenes of the movie is when uh, Art is sort of pressuring. What's his name again? Pat. Patrick. Yeah. He's talking to him about uh, his relationship that he now has with Tashi, and Patrick picks up on the fact that he was uh, trying to sabotage it. You know, when he's like, "Oh, you spoke to Tashi," he's like, eh, "Not, not about you guys." And he immediately knows that that's what he was trying to do. And yeah. then it becomes. I, I think from that point on, the movie is way more about the relationship between those two friends. And I think literally and figuratively, uh, Tashi's character is sidelined after the uh, injury. And uh, I think I thought the approach brutal. I, I I went back in my seat. Yeah, no, dude. When the fucking knee just wouldn't didn't budge, worst <sighs> type of injury. And I felt that like um, from the trailers, uh, based on what people were saying about the movie, that she was going to be more manipul- manipulative than she actually was. And I think once she takes that injury. Her character is, like I said, sidelined. But the stuff yeah. between Josh, I mean, Josh, that's the actor's name, Josh O'Connor, the stuff between Art and Pat, it never lost its momentum. And then that final shot of them embracing was the perfect uh, cap for their story, especially. I don't think an actor has had a more punchable face when he does his little side smile. Oh, yeah, dude. And he hits both of those characters with it. And they both uh, <laughs> want to fucking punch him. <laughs> that one face that Zendaya made in response is hilarious, dude. The way her eyes, <laughs> they're bulging out of her face in absolute disbelief by what he's proposing. And then eight hours later, she's letting them hit it raw. <laughs> I was surprised, man, because Patrick, like, they really did a good job of, like, showing him as like washed up i think earlier where he's kind of he kind of had like a grime to him whereas like the yeah younger, no he's like disgusting. he still had the con- he still had the confidence of when he was younger but like you could see he's just a completely different person but yeah those dynamics are so interesting because at each at certain parts i think each of them are equally equal parts like you're rooting for but equal parts scummy because obviously in the like even art in the beginning when he's like going behind his back I, and i feel like that's just such a a common like dynamic between two friends like you we've probably people probably can see that example like from people they know where it was clear like one's more outgoing more uh confident where the other one's a little bit more subdued and subtle but i could see like that dynamic playing out where, with a guy like art kind of going behind his friend's back to kind of sabotage it but with Patrick not even being threatened by it because he doesn't really see art that way. And even though he has all this success financially in life with Tashi and with tennis, he, him still trying to come over that hurdle of 
not being better than Patrick, I think was a very interesting way to explore that relationship. Yeah, because I think um, going back to the scene that I was talking about earlier, when he finds out what Art is trying to do, that makes him happy. For Art, he's seeing something out of Art that he's always wanted to uh, pull out of him, that passion, that intensity. And I think that's because, you know, Art, was um and i think infatuated i mean uh pat was infatuated with tashi but didn't necessarily love her even though that's not t- something that tashi really wants tashi just wanted to be a great tennis player but i do think that there's a genuine even going beyond platonic love that pat has for art where maybe that is his true love obviously it was it was really never going to work and art's madly in love with tashi so all the dynamics there are just in- incredibly messy but even messier between the two the two boys. That's where I think Tashi sort of, in the third act especially, gets lost in it all. Because I thought in the first two acts, she was great. Especially the first scene. Uh, not the first scene when they talk, but when she joins them in their, their dorm room. Mm. And they're playing the jink- drinking games and they're talking about the stories. You know, even the stories between Pat and Art. It always felt like Pat was his older brother that also had a crush on him. And Art was naive to that, but, you know, obviously looked up to Pat, admired his tennis skills, so he would follow him around. So that scene I also thought was great. And that just reminded me of being an athlete on the road, being in your room, you know, trying to talk to the to the girl athletes that are also staying in the same hotel. Never worked out for me and my boys, but uh, I was happy to see it worked out for them. And then that's where the movie sort of positions her as the the one pulling the strings between these two, that she's got the power and the and the dynamics here. And she was, you know, I I said after Dune Part 2, that's the best she's ever been. This is better than that. This is clearly her best performance. And like I said, being able to play such a messy character who is an adult, who is mature, whose uh, motives aren't always pure. I'm happy to see her in a role like that. Yeah, I agree. I think this is probably her best performance. Um, They all I think they all had just great because when you really look back at the movie, is there another character? Like it really just is them three, the whole entire film. Yeah. The only other it. character who stands out is the uh, the ref. <laughs> and the lady who gave him the donut or the breakfast sandwich. Oh, yeah. That was, uh, yeah, dude. That Dunkin' sandwich was looking good as fuck. I guess those guys on the on the tour at the bottom of the, the rankings, they're not doing too well. They talk about Art like he's some washed up has-been, but he's got three majors under his belt. <laughs> oh, yeah. And he's like... <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty big time. They're, you know, all time greats that are considered some of the best tennis players of all time who have like three or four. And then uh, Pat being like, you know, nobody's ever going to remember him as one of the greatest, but I could be like (laughs) 31 with no majors. Bro, are you crazy? But I think that was just like one of those, you know, they don't really give a shit. Like this movie's not for accuracy. It's for entertainment. So, but I thought that was just a little funny because that even stood out to me. I was just like three majors, not bad. Yeah, why not retire? Sit yeah. on your fucking pile of cash and, uh, you know, call it a day. Well, because I think on the surface, Patrick definitely is more of a uh, dickhead, right? Um, yeah. But subtly, Art is too, not just because, I mean, there are certain moments where you see kind of his arrogance, but um, I think even just like like subtly him joining that tournament. And I think, they, I think he did try to make a point of it by like showing the prize money and giving the position of all these up and comers trying to like what it takes to make one of these big tournaments is you have to do well in the challengers and him like you said a a four-time major winner joining that taking that opportunity away from people who are trying to uh make a name for themselves who are not financially stable like he is you know these people are living out of their cars and he's coming in swooping not caring about that taking their prize money and robbing other people of their opportunity yeah yeah, because he, he's got tunnel vision when it comes to Tashi. I'm going to do whatever right. Tashi says. And I think that's just like a nice little subtle way to be like, all right, maybe he's not outwardly uh, an asshole like Patrick is, but he's also naive to the fact that he is extremely lucky. And like he can't, for some reason, that mental hurdle of not seeing that he won in regards to this little squabble they had uh, is what really holds him back and why I think Tashi is so drawn to Patrick. That's just something missing. If they can combine, I think Tashi would be happy. like the loving and affection of art with the confidence of patrick and you know that's what that's all she wanted from day one yeah yeah and it's that uh that intensity that passion the messiness of his character probably reminds her of what it was like to be a tennis player uh 
So when she's telling him, like, listen, buddy, you know, you're a loser. Get out of my face. This is never going to happen. And then she does go back for him. She's, uh, like I said, her, her motives are very selfish. And it's more driven by uh, instinct rather than logic or reason or any sort of morality. It's how can she feel fulfilled now that she's lost the one thing that made her feel alive. And maybe I'm getting too much into it, but I think that's a, an interesting aspect of the film. And uh, people have talked about this for many, many years. What does an athlete do once they're done? What are, you know? There's one poem, I remember reading it in, in school, where he essentially argues that athletes should kill themselves, that they have nothing left to give. And we see it all the time, how an athlete is a number one star. He's got millions of followers making all this money. And once he retires, he becomes totally irrelevant. He's got a podcast with uh, Richard Jefferson or some bullshit. He's a talking head on ESPN. And some athletes yeah. are better with dealing with that. They can kind of, you know, fit into their new lifestyle and others never get over it. And they it drives them crazy for the rest of their lives. Michael Jordan's a perfect example of that. You know, I think a lot of his vices come from the fact that the one vice is something he can't, the one that he loved the most is the thing he can't do anymore. And that's play professional basketball. Well, yeah, very few athletes hold their status after. I think if you look like a like a Kobe um, or like a Derek Jeter, yeah, I feel right. like they're just kind of immortalized. We're like, that's oh, that's Derek Jeter, that's Kobe. Whereas like you see like John Starks walking by, like oh, that's John Starks. He used to play for the Knicks, right? You know, it's not oh, it's Derek Jeter. He used to play baseball. I mean, we know that we he's Derek Jeter. I think LeBron will have that, but yeah, a lot of them get stuck into this weird uh, part where they're like they don't really have a a role to play either you get into coaching or just kind of go on TV and debate about fucking who's the goat or you just go off and do your own thing. Yeah. So that th there's a lot to, uh, to pick from, from this movie. And, uh, you know, it's not really an angle that you get a lot from sports movies. Sports movies are always, it feels like underdog stories, miracle stories, but this was more so about the psyche, the uh, trying to understand the mindset of an athlete and how that, you know, translate to the translates to the other aspects of their lives. It is crazy though. Like 2010, you tore an ACL, you were gone. Now it's like, oh, you'll, be, you'll be back next year. Good as new. Yeah, dude, it, that felt like a death sentence when we were kids, man. I remember when uh, Jason, Jason kid did it and everybody was yeah. like, oh shit. And he managed to recover. It's only like, it wasn't until Adrian Peterson that like people are like, okay, now we can come back from this with confidence. I think about Adrian Peterson coming back from that injury at least once a week. Just pops in my mind and I'm like, not only did he come back, but he didn't miss a fucking step, bro. Like he came back in six months and he was just the same guy. I've never seen anything like that, bro. Fucking and there was no N no NIL either. So Tashi really missed oh, out by like five, screw, a decade too man. early. Well, no, she's going to get the, the settlement now. So, Oh, yeah, that's true. She would have been making huge money, though. Well, that's why I was surprised. Like, when she was on the billboard with him, I'm like, okay, they're like, the, uh, you know, she's like the Serena, he's like Federer. That's what I was expecting. Right. But it's like, I don't know, she just didn't play after college. Yeah, apparently that was a weird detail, too. Uh, not many pros play that long in college, but I think it was just all for the, for the story. Give them nice little obstacles to go through. But yeah, I mean, Zendaya... As I said, being able to play this this type of character, you just see the star power that she's got. She's obviously an incredible model. I, I've really never appreciated the skill that goes into modeling until Zendaya, because I, I would see her videos and I'm like, man, you just like not even sexualizing her, but you just know how to walk. You know how to look, you know, like the glares and the, the stances like there is a fucking there's a method to it. Dude, and just I, ask and anyone it, like every picture that's ever taken of me. I just look fucking like there's nothing going on in my head. <laughs> it's like it, it is yeah. a skill. Yeah, right. To have that alluring look to you to draw people in, and obviously Hollywood's been known to push models in front of the screen, and uh, it doesn't always work. For the most part, it doesn't work because they're not good actors. But she's proven herself to be a really good actor, and uh, I just love the people that she's working with. I love her mindset for uh, for her career. I hope she, no pun intended, I hope she continues to challenge herself with roles like this. <laughs> Because yeah, this yeah. is what's, you know, it's the perfect balance. It's the Leo balance, you know, do films that are going to garner that critical acclaim and then do a blockbuster, then do a big budget or, or a nice little HBO series that's going to get you eyeballs. But well, it helps a nice block, healthy balance. Yeah, it helps when your blockbusters are acclaimed. Like 
like Dune is. And even with Anya Taylor Joy being such a big star, you know, picking the right blockbuster, even though Furiosa isn't doing great at the box office, but that type of movie, you know, pick that instead of being, you know, stick woman. Right. <laughs> is that you a, know, is that I got superhero? that stick talk. That stick. Yo, if that one with the future soundtrack, walking around <laughs> with a stick, oh, you got that stick talk. That stick talk. That would be hard as fuck. <laughs> What would stick woman's powers be? Is she does she use a stick or is she can turn into like a stick? It's like the the Gandalf stick. Nobody knows yeah. really what he's doing mm-hmm. with it. But he you come across stick woman <laughs> when you're doing some shit that you shouldn't be doing. Like oh, Moses, yeah, cause... just throw that shit turns into a yeah. fucking snake. Or it could be that stick, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, the the stick. That Cassidy verse is stuck in my fucking head forever. The best part is that you can't remember that line without thinking of the way he delivers it too. Because he was so confident. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break, shout out our sponsor, and then we'll be back. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like opening a window that doesn't have a screen on it. Sure, you're going to enjoy the cool breezes coming in, but there's also bugs and stuff flying through the window, and that's not cool. I'm talking to you, European hotel owners. ExpressVPN is the best option for those looking to stay safe on the internet while keeping the good stuff in and keeping the bad stuff out. When you log into a public network, your sensitive data like banking information, personal passwords, they're all at risk. And hackers can make up to $1,000 per person by selling personal information on the dark web. Man, that's what Mr. Robot should have been doing. ExpressVPN creates a secure, encrypted tunnel between your devices and the internet. Their private networks provide a layer of protection that keeps hackers from stealing any sensitive data. Get your hands off my data. ExpressVPN is also extremely easy to use. You just fire up the app, click one button to get protected. Plus, it works on all devices. Phones, laptops, tablets, smart fridges. Do they still make those? I don't know if it works on that. Don't don't quote me so you can stay secure on whichever device you use to surf the web so head on over to expressvpn.com slash nerd soup to secure your online data today that's e-x-p-r-e-s-s vpn.com slash nerd soup and you can get an extra three months free with expressvpn.com slash nerd soup yeah uh the other day uh speaking of sticks you know the the saying hit a lick right yeah it's an old saying or at least i didn't know it was an old saying but i'm watching this uh world war ii documentary the world at war bbc production 1973 narrated by Lawrence olivier it's awesome but uh, i got to the episode where it was the u.s entering the war and the title was called on our way and it got me so hyped i was like yeah let's fucking <clears throat> so there was a uh, like a a fundraiser when the u.s officially declared or germany declared war on us And it was some celebrity, I don't know who it was, but he was giving a speech to a crowd. And he's like, you have to remember, these Germans did not come out of the sky. They are not superhuman. They can be licked. And they will be licked. I was like, yo. Yo. (laughs) He's talking crazy. (laughs) And then he not only did he say they will be licked, and he goes, by men. (laughs) Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that just got me so hyped. I didn't realize hit a lick went back then. I guess that kind of does feel like old timey. Hey, hey, Shani, let's go hit a lick. Yeah, imagine your grandpa telling you war stories. Uh, yeah, we licked those Nazis. I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out All right, let's go to uh, let's go to some fan questions. Challengers, good movie, good movie. Yeah, I liked it. Oh, this is a good one here from Strawberry Jam. Can you guys explain how you use Letterbox's five star ranking system? I've been given. I feel like in the beginning when I first started, I was like, oh, I have to be sacred. Five stars sacred now. Not not to say I just hand them out, but like, if I really like a fucking movie, I'm giving you five stars. I just gave one the other day, Mad Max Fury Road. Five yeah, stars, I think baby. people are, uh, some people are a bit too picky when it comes to what they hand out five stars. Well, I think that you, you, some people fall in a trap where it's like, well, all right, what's five stars for me? Godfather Part Two, that's five stars. That's five stars. Right. When you compare it to that scale where you're like, you see a movie like Fury Road and you're like, oh, I really liked that movie. It's such a great action movie. Wow, that was, that was a great experience. But am I really putting it on the same level as Godfather Part Two? Because in your head, you're like, that's the standard of great cinema. And to put something into that category, it has to be. No, for what that is, as an, I don't know, that sounded weird coming out of my mouth. Uh, for what that is, as an action movie, it is like a five star, one of the best action movies of the past, like, 
decade. So like, give that shit five stars. Yeah, in my head canon, I go five stars is masterpiece. Four and a half is near perfect. Four is great. Three and a half is really good. Three is good. Two and a half is average. Two is below average. One and a half is bad. One is horrible. And yeah. a half star is just uh, criminal. So that's how I've done the the head canon there. But I'm I've also thought of doing the uh, cutting out the half star reviews entirely and just going one, bad. two, three, four, five because uh, I know a lot of people do that and it does feel a bit cleaner. Because once you get keep, into the whole four and a half, five territory, it's a you know it's a little silly. I keep wanting I want to use the heart more. Like a five heart is like oh now we're cooking. Like right? Yeah, I remember you saying that. I just I never really implemented it. I do. It's not everybody does this, but I go with the if it's at least a two and a half, it could get a heart. Anything above three is getting a heart, or three and above. Just just naturally, that's how I've done it. So. I can't replace it now because I've I've hearted every movie I've liked. Can you see what you've given five stars? Uh yeah. If you go to films and uh, you just have to filter it out, show the highest rated first. Ah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Let's see. And also, like, I feel like my what is it bell curve yeah. or whatever is uh, skewed because it's like. A lot of these movies I rewatch, and I only rewatch movies I really fucking like. I have a lot of four and a half, five stars. But the only five stars I have are Oppenheimer, Whiplash, Dark Knight, Dune 2, Inglorious Bastards, Arrival, Fellowship, Mad Max, Empire, The Other Lord of the Rings. You know, so it's like, you know. I've got high. 207 with five stars. I Damn. just broke two, but uh, a lot of them have been uh, for Hands this year. Breath, Machina. Oh, I gave Rear Window five stars. There you go, Kubrick. Not Kubrick. <laughs> fucking idiot. <laughs> Giving him that shot. I almost, uh, yeah, I was like, whoa. Yeah. It almost, you almost convinced me. I was like, I know. Kubrick. <laughs> Wait, did Kubrick? Did it really know? When it's always an old of... movie, it's like, eh, it's either Kubrick or Hitchcock, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't even think I have any Kubrick. Well, it would be if I like rewatch. That's the thing, too. If I rewatch, like, uh space odyssey like that's gonna you know i just haven't watched it in my letterbox era right recently i gave two concert movies five stars uh stop making sense and uh the big steppers tour kendrick lamar i'm kendrick lamar AKA that's another Demi- thing i missed down what happened who won oh. i just know he put like four songs in a row god dude i could not tell you what that friday night was like when he dropped meet the grams because <laughs> i like you really cooked minutes. them like that huh dude it, I, i've it was unbelievable uh for like two weeks after it i was like riding a high of it was like watching a great anime because i had listened to the drake song family matters and i'm a kendrick guy i like drake i wanted kendrick to win because i'm a kendrick guy but i wasn't going to be biased so i'm listening to family matters and i'm like this is this is it like this is the death blow kendrick's not recovering this is going to be on every fucking radio station every club all the drake fans are going to be drop 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 and he's he, he's not cooking kendrick he's cooking everybody he's like asap you want some rick ross you want it okay john morant and i was like this is it this is over and then all of a sudden dude i get a text i'm like yo did you hear the new new kendrick i'm like yeah it dropped in the morning he's like nah the new new kendrick i was like no fucking <laughs> way <laughs> and that opening line <laughs> he's like dear adonis I, I had to turn it off i was like i can't listen to this I didn't even make it to the second verse before (laughs) I turned it off and I was like, this is it. He won. (laughs) Yeah. And then when he dropped, not like us, I was like, this is, this is excessive. I was like, this is, and then I heard that beat and I was like, yo, this is, (laughs) this is fire. Is Drake like respectable? Like people will say like ether, you know, destroy Jay-Z, but like Jay-Z is still like, all right, well take over still really good. Like, Maybe more people think Nas won, but like Jay Z didn't come out getting clowned. Is Drake like clowned? I think Family Matters is going to be a song. It's going to become his takeover. Yeah. We'll see what the impact is because Takeovers to me is just such a great song. But one even time, like, like one of the best albums of all time, too. Right, right. Yeah. That that really does help it. But I think the the heart part six was that's the best way to win a beef, dude, where you give your opponent the last word and you don't even have to say anything because your shit is just going up and up and up because not like us, it's been huge. You know, that was the victory lap. Everybody just sort of clowning on Drake using BBL Drizzy. 
and uh, not like us. But the hard part six was brutal. I mean, he was rapping his ass off. But like when you have to, I mean, everybody's made this joke. When you have to hop on a track and be like, I'm too famous to be a sex offender. <laughs> it just sounds so crazy. <laughs> well, it's like, I feel like it got weird from what I like was reading. Like when he's like, oh, I leaked that I have a daughter. Oh, yeah. No, like, he was totally capping about all that shit. Like he, he was too online. Because yeah. that was all over the internet's those like that two day interval of Kendrick lied about the daughter, uh, which he you know he clearly did. But that was the that was the move. He, he took the air completely out of Family Matters. Uh, just an anime counter, dude. Like this isn't even my final form type shit. And like this is something I've been waiting for for all of us. You know, we've we grew up on Drake, and then Kendrick came on a, a little later, and those have always been you know the two titans. And it was always, you know, I always wanted to see it because I thought Kendrick was the better rapper. But I was like, if anybody can take this guy out in a one-on-one, it's it's Drake. Because I think he's firmly number two. I've always preferred Drake over Cole and a lot of his other contemporaries lyrically. Um, He fought, man. But I think he underestimated how much Kendrick hates him. <laughs> Yo, he fucking hates him. Yeah. <laughs> he does not like him. But um yeah it is because people forget like back to back was fucking that was monumental dude yeah and then even with the push of t stuff like yeah but drake never responded but he just you know became a good dad <laughs> so like <laughs> it was weird like he obviously and doopy freestyle is a good track yeah once again got all the air taken out of it but and that was more so directed at uh Kanye but that's Drake's that's Drake's issue and it was the same thing Jay-Z did underestimate your competition you see the video of the bar mitzvah of uh all the kids rapping the Kendrick song <laughs> yeah all the tweets are like it'd be your own people <laughs> yeah. yeah that's brutal yeah you can't have you can't have your <laughs> this track playing at bar mitzvahs man but that, I, I kept telling Teddy I was like Drake's approach should have been like I'm I'm the goat I'm the fucking best. Don't do all this, you know, your wife uh, banged your bodyguard or or this. Like, don't make it, like, make it about yourself. Like, I'm the best. I do better numbers than you. I'm hotter than you. I'm better than you lyrically. And just double down. Like, I would have been calling him a leprechaun, um, a cotton ball, a decimal, any small thing I could think of. Like, I would have just, all small puns. Get gritty with it. And the personal shit, because Kendrick told him on Euphoria, don't go there because I'm going to go even lower, bro. And uh, he got clapped. That's got to be nerve wracking. Just waiting for the response. The, well, the funniest shit, too, was those two weeks after uh, Taylor made and push ups dropped the constant trolling from Drake's side. You know, when is he going to drop? When is he going to drop? Oh, I guess he's got nothing to say. <laughs> and then to hit yeah. him with the four piece chicken nugget. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the heart part, with six, all he's the like, sauces? yo, I all even, the sauces, dude. It's not like, you know, when you get like the nugget, they give you one sauce. It's like, now nah, they hooked them up. All the condiments, man. <laughs> Fucking the 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 McFlurry machine was on and revving. <laughs> Never tasted better. And then on the hard part six, he's like, "You could drop a million more times. I don't care." <laughs> just underestimated his competition, man. And um, Jake, shout out to Jake Cole, though. He just got the fuck out of there. <laughs> so, yeah, the I'm memes about this. that have been so funny, dude. Just uh, him on his bike. I'll tell you what. I was. Uh, I understand the decision. But I was also hoping that J. Cole would have went at him on some lyrical shit. Like, yeah, yeah they've crowned you, like, but I'm better. People like two force the criticism for Kendrick is like to go. Like, oh, I don't want to have to look up, you know, pause and read the lyrics. And I feel like that's a whack criticism. And that's not even like if I think if J. Cole did that, it would be some more like deep fucking philosophical type this where it's like, no, nah, like you said, just like call him short. <laughs> yeah, no, Drake should have just went the ether route, just nonstop ethers. But uh, somebody yeah, when, here, you, when, you, when you compare Takeover to Ether, one's like a uh, systematic dismantling of Nas's whole discography, and the other is just like, I fucking hate you. You like <laughs> just calling, basically just calling him names, and that's what people are like. Fuck yeah, he got you. Yeah, he got your ass. Jokes are more important than facts, and it was yeah. true then, and um, it's true now. I almost feel relieved that I don't have to defend Jay Z for Ether anymore. I've given that up because my guy won this one. So I'm like, yeah, no, Jay-Z lost. Won the war, though. I'll still push that. But uh, And uh, Young Jonesy here says, uh, favorite bar from the beef. My two favorite bars, I think, uh, 
the first one when Drake flipped the whole Prince Mike Jack thing, saying, uh, what's a prince to a king? He a son. That was the route Drake should have just kept going on. You know, like clever shit like that. Cause that's a bar. And then when uh Ken, <laughs> I was listening to this in in uh public on Euphoria when he said, uh, when I see you stand by sexy red, I believe you see two bad bitches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. There's real competition. You might pop ass with <laughs> Every time now I like listen to a Drake song and he says something zesty, I hear that line <laughs> like a war flashback. Oh, that was funny. Uh, and uh, not like us is just so dismissive. It's such a victory lap. Like uh, when he's like, you ain't law boy, you ball boy, fetch Gatorade or something. It's just not even clever, but it's just so mean. <laughs> like that. Yeah. <laughs> That whole verse is just like mean and and he's just having a great time. He's doing the West Coast uh mustard on the beat. Oh, beat. Oh. Oh, LA accent. Just an incredible we're talking about, hip hop. I think we were talking about beef's last podcast and I texted you. I'm like, how did we forget 50 Cent and Ja Rule? All well, the whole murder rank thing. Yeah, that was um 50 Cent was absolutely fearless. He was destroying careers to his own detriment. Back Down is one of my favorite songs ever, dude. Remember we were going on a family vacation and like we packed the fucking car out. This is when I was young. This is like when Get Rich, Get Rich or Die Trying was out. I had my CD player and I was like in the trunk of like the the SUV. Like That's how packed out this car was. And you know, like when you sing, but you don't know how loud you're singing because you're listening to music. Yeah, and the music cuts. So <laughs> I was, uh, uh, what the fuck's the name of the song? But I kept going, murder, I don't believe you, murder. <laughs> and this is like, I don't Your know, life's I'm, like on the line. I'm like 10 or 11. <laughs> so the most embarrassing thing is like people were actually hearing me and I didn't notice. And once I took out, everyone in the car was going, murder. <laughs> I was just like <laughs> fucking like crawled up in the back of the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then Eminem came in, ruined Ja Rule too. That was fucking brutal. Well, it, it's similar approach to um, that Kendrick took with Drake. He, you know, with Ja Rule, it was way more flagrant because I think Drake's been way cooler about it. He just makes better music than Ja Rule. But, you know, the transition Drake made from being sort of rap R&B to also incorporating the mafioso persona. And uh, the people that Drake runs with, I, I don't, I'll never understand why these rappers do it who don't <clears throat> come from the streets. Because he's got like weird shit going on with his crew and the weekend's crew. But that was, you know, one of the major angles that Kendrick took is um, that you're fake. You know, you're putting on this persona for your music. And, uh, you know, it's one thing if you if you come from that background. It's like Tupac. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, it's true. <laughs> that is the East Coast <laughs> man inside of you, dude. That is such a like 1990 fucking nine thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> taking shots at tupac man he was a theater kid no he was yeah no he was but he also stood on business yeah like when it was time to get gritty you know not like big though no but that was no sir that and that was one of the angles that yeah that people have still taken with uh tupac to this day i remember a few years ago funk flex was talking about all that shit and uh the east coast is still not over that man they still not <laughs> over hit him up <laughs> that, that was fucking that was brutal <laughs> I remember watching that movie and when Hit Him Up came, came on and you see Biggie listening. His first reaction was like to obviously yell at his wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't think that's bigger, bigger problems. This man just came after your head. You know what I love for Jay-Z that he gets a mention at the end. It's like, fuck bad boy. Fuck Jay-Z. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit. It's weird to think that Jay-Z was, yeah, he was uh, around, around there. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, Jay-Z had the line on, can I live to, uh, I don't hate on those who hate me. I got Pac on. <clears throat> oh, rap beef. Good times. Good times. Yeah. Is it the best rap beef ever? It's definitely. Yeah. No, I think for this, the spectacle without a doubt. Yeah. Well, I'll save it for next podcast, but I do have my G unit rankings. Oh, that's fun. I'll make a PowerPoint. Ch -ch -ch -ch. I'll tell you what, as, as many people as 50 cent used to cook, he got wrecked by Jada kiss. See, that's the, that's the approach. You can make it personal. You can make it gossipy. But if you just lay down like 48 bars, some of the best rapping you've ever done on, on a nice beat, that goes a long way, dude. Because whenever people bring up 50 Cent ruining careers, somebody always mentions Jadakiss. Like, yeah, but Jadakiss got his ass. 
Yeah. And it's true. That Checkmate is one of the best diss tracks ever. You know Snoop dropped a G-Unit once? He dropped a G-Unit diss? No, like a G-Unit. Oh, that's a, that's cool. I like that. Now, yeah, I've found a lot of curious ones in my research. Not cute, but like... What about Dave Chappelle's? He's got a good one. <laughs> oh, yeah, with his kid. <laughs> that is the best uh, ad lib probably in hip hop. And the best G-unit. name for a crew, yeah. Gorilla yeah. unit? Are you fucking kidding me, dude? They had the shoes. Remember you had the G units? Oh, Did yeah. you ever have the G units? Or yeah. you were a fat farm kid? No, actually, no. I had the rock aware. There's a great commercial that 50 Cent and Jay-Z did for their sneakers. And they're both just wrapping their asses off. It's like the only collab they've ever done besides uh, I Get Money Remix. Well, what was the uh, the Boost Mobile commercial with Kanye West? Uh, I, think I, the game I vaguely was remember that. That was a fucking, that was a commercial. That was a good song, too. Well, uh, Aiden here says, top five diss songs ever. Ether seems to be number one for most people. <laughs> I would say Ether, hit him up. N- not counting any of the Drake and Kendricks. I love Checkmate, like I just said, from Jadakiss. Uh, Bridge is Over is the classic. Yeah, Takeover. No Vaseline, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's that one's that's wild. Yeah, that's just so good. What's the Eminem? What's, I was listening to the other day. The Haley's Revenge? The Jaw Rule diss? I he think so, that. yeah. Yeah. The one he's got against uh, Benzino, too, is brutal. That shit is funny. Back to back, I think. Yeah. Kind of gets lost now of all that, but people forget when I came oh, out. Oh, no, that's I mean, elite. She shut him out. I think that's that a top 10, of. without a doubt. Yeah. No, and uh, I think it's true that. Is that a world tour or your girl's tour? Is fucking yeah. crazy. Um, yeah, one of the best fucking. This is not what ever. she meant when she said to open up more. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> come on. And I agree with and, the point people are making that uh, Drake came in as an underdog, but he came in as an underdog against Meek and he crushed him. Yeah, he never responded. I think Meek did respond. It was just awful. Did he? Yeah. Because so people thought, you know, Meek Mill's a battle rapper. This is what he does. And Is uh, it worse to not respond or to respond and no one remembers because of how That's definitely bad it worse. Was. Yeah. Like Drake was smart not to uh, respond to Pusha T. There's nothing you could say there that unless you made like a... Uh, just the two of us remix. <laughs> what if you're just waiting for Adonis to get older or just to fucking fire back at him? Bro, that's what everybody keeps saying. Adonis now has a playlist for when uh, Drake grounds him. <laughs> you just get to hear do, 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 do. <laughs> uh, this question here from Clammy. Holy fuck, I miss you guys. Uh, fuck, marry, kill the three leads and challengers. I'm killing Pat. I'm marrying Art. And, uh, Fucking Tashi. Yeah. I was thinking like marrying Tashi, but like Art no, does not look like he's having that. a great time. <laughs> 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 At least with Art, like, you know, you know he's by your side. Yeah. Yeah, and he's killing he, Josh. You know, he's cute. Yeah, Josh, get out of here. You're not hot. You're not hotter than Tashi, but this question here from B underscore Allen. Why can't movies stop doing the floating head posters? I was They're looking awful. at posters the other day. I was doing a deep dive on posters. The inability to make intriguing movie posters it will never like it's such a surprising thing because you even have like posters like what was it? Oh, I was watching Past Lives, um, and I was looking at the movie poster. And what, what do you think about posters like that, where it's just a screenshot from the movie rather versus creating a specific image for a poster? I don't hate it. It always depends on uh, you know. Challengers took a behind the scenes shot and then touched it up for a poster. I don't hate I the like Past the Lives poster. posters. Yeah, no, I like them too. Like I mean, movies Furiosa's. are missing that old uh, approach of the Furiosa one's horrible, but getting an yeah. actual artist to like create a poster. Like the one you posted on your letterbox, that's just so much better. It's like these yeah. alternate posters are usually so much better, or even the minimalist ones. Even, um, like I have a couple posters in my apartment and they're pretty cool because they're like, not minimalist, but they're just like alternate posters, like not the official movie poster. Like my fellowship is from, it's like the two statues that they go through with like the old Gondor statues, you know? And I, I just prefer like, it's just so much more aesthetically pleasing than just the faces on the poster. Oh yeah, dude. And there's always like um, an international poster that's so much better than the one we get. They'll be like, look at the poster for challengers in Poland. And it's just amazing. How much does, well, even the alternate like Pan's Labyrinth poster is fucking awesome. Does the director have much say? I don't think they have any say over that. 
Directors don't even have a uh, say on how their trailers are cut. That's the thing. They've taken out so much of, um, and they're cutting quarters, but they've taken away these creative decisions and just offloaded them onto s- so-called specialists. Like even like I popular this week on Letterbox, like Furiosa trash, Challenge is good, Fall Guy trash. Don't hate the Fury Road one. Yeah, it's not terrible. Uh, I, I saw the TV glow. That's actually a nice poster. I want to see that so bad. Is that out? Like, what? What is that? Like, I know it came out. Like, for I think it's in the city. Ah. Uh, oh wow! No, it's at a uh, Cinema de Lou. Oh, let's go. Let's do it. Yeah, what no, I'll be down I was going to ask that. you actually. I was, was going to ask you. I forgot what movie it was though. Oh, What's coming man, out? It's soon? at the Hunting and Dining too. Might get a fucking snack. What's coming out soon? A movie that's not going to be here, here though. We would have to go to the city. Uh. uh I don't know. I'll get, I'll get back to you on that one. Yeah, posters get, suck. Yeah. Did you get Deadpool tickets yet? No, no, I didn't. I'm not. I'm boycotting Deadpool. You are? Yeah, everybody told me if you want Logan to be the last time you've seen Wolverine, then don't watch it. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Although the See, last got, trailer kind of made me interested. <laughs> I bought a Thursday ticket just for whatever, only because... I'm not like, oh, Deadpool. Oh, I love like, you know, like the Deadpool people. Yeah. yeah, like, oh, yeah. Super into Deadpool. Um, it wouldn't be a Thursday movie for me, but like I kind of miss the, the Thursday crowd, Marvel yeah. crowd. Like as much as we clown on it, like there was something to it. And I'm kind of trying to hope to recapture that just to have a fun movie experience. Um, yeah. And this isn't even me being uh, tired of, of superhero movies because a lot of people are pushing that. But. I I just can't stand the fact that Hugh Jackman's back as Wolverine. I think it's just so just seeing him in the costume with the muscles. I'm like, yo, go eat a sandwich, bro. It's been, it's enough. Everything just has to be fucking, you know. And it's not even like uh, I'm being one of those like a great movie comes out and announce a sequel. Oh my god, does everything need a sequel? Like, yo, this is gonna be like his tenth time playing this character, and they finally did it perfectly. And they're like, you know what? Let's come back for a fucking comedy. And it does get to a point where it's like, yo, move on, man. Go, Jeremy Allen White's standing right there. Give me short, short King Wolverine. It's not even an anti. I want more Wolverine, but I want him to be short. The rear window, 70th anniversary coming out soon. Oh, wow. Shout out Kubrick. Grace Kelly, though. Whew. Yeah. Good movie. She like, um, like retired from acting early and like married the, the, like the Prince of Lichtenstein or some shit like that. Go off, girl. Um, you seen The Birds? Yeah. That's a movie that scarred me for life as a child. <laughs> Every time I see a fucking swarm of birds, I still get scared. Oh, Monaco. That's who she made. Yeah, okay. Good movie. All oh, Kinds of Kindness. That's what it was. Oh, right, right. Yeah, that's supposed to be good. So that's coming out in... Somebody described it as an allergic reaction to Lanthimos's recent success in the mainstream. Nice. Which makes me really excited. That's coming out in June. It might come out here, actually. Now that I think of it. But yeah, Jesse Plemons won Best Actor at Con. I feel like that would be a fun um, Alamo movie. Yeah, yeah, it would be. I'm actually might go to Brooklyn this upcoming Sunday to go see Caitlin Clark. No, that's sick. Who's she Dude. playing? Liberty. Yeah, I mean, so Dude, far cr- it's just me, Manny, and Cam. So if you want to come, cheap tickets. How much are tickets? Like sixty, but they're okay. up high. But every seat in Barclays is pretty good. What day? Next Sunday. Maybe. Let me check my schedule. WNBA, <laughs> baby. I don't have shit to. T- I don't have shit to do. Yeah. yeah. This might have. So- is it a day game or a night game? Uh, night game. Okay. Let me just see what time I have softball. Seven p.m. That's another insane fucking thing that, that they're H- all trying to get. <laughs> Dude, it's like I get it. Like you want to. Like this is the league. Like diff- I get all that. Same thing in all sports. It's not not even much so the other players. It's just the media. Like the attention she's bringing is like good for the league and all these like think pieces and hit pieces. Like I'm sure, like maybe like the problem. Maybe there is some validity to some of these. And yeah, sure. Like I think people just see a headline and like without actually reading the thing and actually seeing the perspective and whatever. And I'm fine with all that. But like at the end of the day, like for her, like she just wants to like play basketball, <laughs> and it just kind of like all the distractions on a rookie year. And I think the turnaround from college to just jumping right in with not even like a mini camp because the season started right away is very detrimental, not just to her, but to all the players coming into the league. Right. Yeah. And I think that her arrival is going to change so many aspects of the sport 
like that that are just clumsy because it's always been an afterthought. But yeah, yeah we're kind of giving it a pass for like other sports because we're just so used to the fucking talking heads just making stories out of nothing but now that it's kind of translating to the women's game it's like one aspect like that's kind of good because now uh, in a lot of ways it legitimizes it as like a actual league and sport that people care about that it's getting these kind of think pieces and uh debates on like in the news and not sports center so in one way it's kind of a good thing two years ago no one would care to even discuss it yeah oh yeah it's uh the old saying all press is good press it's just putting more eyeballs i've seen this like all these should be going at the camera brink she's averaging six points (laughs) (laughs) i know and that's all everyone talks about at least clark's putting up 18 and 7 as a rookie yeah i mean like you said with uh some of the thing pieces it's just getting a little bit too excited about all this uh attention but i think it's it's fun because angel reese just can't resist taking shots at Caitlin. I like Angel Reese. Yeah, no, I like it too. So I'm like, this is so good for the marketing of the game. I know. Like, this is going to be a great rivalry for years to come. Like, I I can't wait for that first uh, Fever Sky game. Like, I've never talked about this about WNBA. (laughs) Dude, even the LSU games, I watched a game two years ago, and then this past one, I was like, look at, oh my God, Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark back at it. Like, it's the perfect little battle because... Like even the way they play the game. That was my you introduction. Three to, point shooter. Right, and then yeah. you have like the, you know, the big man or big woman. I feel like that's, you can't call a big, uh, a forward or center. And you can't say big woman. That just sounds <laughs> yeah, like sounds you say funny. big man. No, I yeah. think they could still be big man. Yeah. Um, but that was my introduction to Caitlin Clark is just for like weeks leading up to that LSU game. I, I kept seeing highlights of this. This uh, this chick on Iowa who was launching from half court all the time and sinking it. So I'm like, yo, I need to like tune into this. Well, that's why like, even like Tyrese Halliburton, like I know a lot of Nick fans clowned him for putting on the Reggie Miller sweatshirt, but I found myself watching that game seven, like the way he was just so cocky with it. Obviously, I hated it and it was a miserable time, but like reflecting on it, I'm like, that was kind of cold. Like, there's just something about being able to talk shit and then also back it up. And not back down in that moment. Yeah, I think the coolest instance of that was um, last year, Heat, Milwaukee. When uh, I can't remember what game it was, but Miami was down like 12. And Jimmy Butler was just chirping at Drew Holiday nonstop. Like he just kept owning Drew Holiday and they weren't winning. And he was just like, I'm on your ass. And then eventually Miami won. And I was just like, yeah. this man's a fucking psychopath. Like he truly did not care that he was down. He just so well, confident. Luke and so Ru- Rudy Gobert two nights yeah. ago was fucking great. Um, Luca Magic, baby. It is so funny. Like that type of shit talk, like you would expect, like it is so fun. Like, um, I think someone did a skit like this, but but it, instead of basketball, it was like uh, battle dancing. It's like you would just talk to shit like you're about to fight and then you would just bust out a dance move. <laughs> and that's how that's who would determine the winner. It's it's so funny to me when you talk so much shit, like fighting words, and you back it up. Like the way you have to back it up is just hitting a shot. <laughs> yeah, and it feels so bad when you miss after you've yeah. been talking shit, man. You could see it in uh, the way Edwards was playing in that game too. Like all the outside noise was really getting to him because he looks so frustrated after every miss. He's like, fuck, I'm supposed to be Jordan now. <laughs> it's been fun though. I'm hoping that whoever comes out of the West just beats the shit out of the Celtics. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, that does it for this episode of Nerd Suit. We're going to wrap it up there and we will be back very soon for definitely our Furiosa review because that was... uh might be my five favorite movie stars, of the huh? year. Yeah, five yeah. stars, man. It was so fun. Better than Fury Road? It, it's tough to say. I'm going to say no just because it's new. I don't want to do the recency bias, but it's very. it's got a lot of Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049 in it where they're just two perfect companion pieces. It makes Fury Road better. The first thing you're going to want to do after Furiosa is jump right back in to uh, Fury Road because the characters are a bit stronger this time. For all the, it, it felt like he was answering some of the complaints which I didn't have and many people didn't. Um, Because this one is, uh, it's a bit heavier. It's uh, more nihilistic. It's more leaning into the the psyches of these characters and how they grapple and how they even deal with living in this apocalyptic world. But the action's just as fucking good. And there are some moments where he upped the creativity where you're just like in awe of what you're seeing, man. I can't wait to watch it again. It's worth the IMAX ticket, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. 
Well, I heard she only had like 20 lines. Yeah. And 18 of them are on Furiosa. It does. So the girl who plays young Furiosa is also amazing, which I didn't expect. It's firmly Anya Taylor-Joy's movie to, uh, you know, she's the star, obviously. And she does have a lot of incredible moments. But I was surprised by how much I loved uh, the young Furiosa, the even younger. She was great. She barely has any lines too, but another one who had that look of just pure rage and intensity the entire time. I was, I was scared of that little kid. <laughs> I, it, I love in movies when they're like, uh, <laughs> this is like an anime in Gran Torino when you do a flashback and he's like six five, and in the future he's like four t- four five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of what George Miller did. He's like Anya Taylor Joy, younger because she's shorter than Charlize Theron. <laughs> oh, it is funny. That's good stuff. But yeah, we'll be back for that. So, uh, yeah, tune in. Aaron, uh, what do you got going on the rest of the day? Going to a wedding. Oh, and nice. And I have nothing tomorrow. Memorial Day, though. It's good to have day. You know, people barbecue, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't get invited to anything. Well, if you want, you could come over and watch the World War II doc that I'm going to try and finish. I love a good documentary. Got the U-boats in the Atlantic, baby. Woo! All right, guys. No we'll spoilers. See. No spoilers. Wow, that was probably our best review yet. Hey guys, Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey here with a brief shameless plug before we end the video. Do you ever feel like you don't have an adequate amount of nerd soup in your life? Like you're going to bed hungry and yearning for the nonsensical yet entertaining nutrients our podcasts provide? Well, we've come up with the perfect solution. The Nerd Soup Fan Question Podcast, exclusively available to our Patreon supporters. You can sign up now by visiting patreon.com slash nerdsoup, and for the price of only $1 per month, you'll receive exclusive access to our weekly podcast, where we answer your questions that don't make it to the main show. And while you're there, you can check out the other rewards we offer to our patrons, like stick Stickers, mugs, t-shirts, behind-the-scenes footage, and appearing in the credits at the end of our videos. And that's exactly what we're gonna do right now. Roll the names of the nerds who make Nerd Soup possible. The reason why the crypto crash didn't send our lives spiraling down a black hole of no return. Alright, I'll stop talking so you can listen to this jazzy-ass music while checking if Bo spelt your name wrong in the credits.